gosh, hi, San Francisco. Yes, we did it. I was born in this city. I've been, last time I went to this planetarium, though, was the day I got braces and I came to see a Cure Laser light show, so I'm excited to be back. Um, thank you guys so much for coming out to this event. We're so excited to talk about women in STEM. I'm so excited. Not one, but two panels. The way we're going to do this is uh, we're going to give our ologists and our doctors and our amazing folks up here a little bit more time. So um, I'm just going to ask them a ton of questions. And then at the very end, we're going to do some Q&A, just so you know. Um, but first, I would love to introduce our two first panelists. Um, so exciting to be here. And we, we were like, who are we going to pair with whom? Um, and I'm so glad you're here. This is a, a data scientist we have with us, crunches numbers for a living, and has also studied salamanders and lizards and rattlesnakes. And then we also have someone who is an expert in old botany and cycads, which are a type of plant that are endangered. So if you guys could introduce yourselves to this amazing crowd. And also, really quick though, crowd, give yourselves a, a round of applause for being here. Yes. Look at you all. You're here. You're standing. You're learning. You might have a Chardonnay buzz. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm so excited to just geek out with you guys all here. So yes. Yeah, so introduce yourselves to these lovely people. I will start. Um, I'm Seema Bouzid, and I am a data scientist at Invite, which is a medical genetics company. Um, but before that, I was an evolutionary biologist, and I studied Yosemite's lizards at high elevation. Know, right? Hi, I'm Natalie Nagalingam. I am a curator of botany here at the Cal Academy of Sciences. Um, Uh, so, as you can tell from my accent, I'm not from here. I'm originally from Australia, uh, and my family is originally from a tiny island called Mauritius. Anyone been there? <laughs> Crickets. All right. Someone over there? We'll put that on our bucket list. Oh, someone, you have been there? I wish we had a prize for you. <laughs> I can't even high five you, because I don't want to give anyone diseases. No one wants to get a disease. Um, so, I salute you. Um, and so, now, you have both done... I'm guessing extensive field work. You worked with lizards and rattlesnakes. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you got into science? What made you love it? I can. Um, and so I always liked critters. Um, mm -hmm. I was always outside picking up things on the ground. Um, and I was terrified of snakes. And I applied to some internships at Berkeley where I was an undergrad. Um, I got a little internship at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology where the first job I had was refilling ethanol in snake jars. <laughs> oh no, um, <laughs> that's your nightmare, but they were dead. They were all dead, but it was still scary to be in a room, a small room full of jars of snakes. Um, and then four short years later, I was milking venom from rattlesnakes in Mexico. <laughs> what? Was there a moment where you were just like, gloves are off, like it's happening? Did you have a moment where you really conquered that fear? I think like, after a couple weeks of like snake scales under my nails, <laughs> I just was like, this is fine. This is totally fine. <laughs> so just as, let that be a lesson to all of us. We'll get used to anything. You can get used to anything that sucks in your life, um, or is at least scary. And now you went the botany route, the plant route. Were you like a child resurrecting all the house plants? How did you get into it? No, so actually I can't grow anything. Um, <laughs> I'm really terrible. <laughs> That's my like little dirty secret, that as a botanist, I can't grow anything. Um, oh my God. But I, I came into science, I'm actually a real city person, and I, I came into science through reading and through documentaries, and I started learning about the environment when I was a teenager and the environmental problems, and I thought, I want to do something about this. Um, and so I sort of headed on my path to science. Is, now you study cycads. <laughs> wow, how about that, you guys? <laughs> You know this hall is haunted, right? <laughs> a bunch of antelope ghosts. Um, <laughs> well, you, your cycads are what you study, and they are endangered. Is that because of you, that they're endangered? <laughs> <laughs> it, it sort of is very fitting that I would choose a plant that is sort of on the, on the brink. Yeah. But um, it's kind of because of all of us, really. So they're endangered because people um, have land clearing, they're endangered because they grow so slowly. And the crazy thing is, 
is they're endangered because people steal them. They go <laughs> into the wild and they will steal plants. What is it about a cycad that people are so thirsty for? People love cycads because of the connection to the dinosaurs. So all of you guys, you have, probably even haven't heard of cycads, but if you draw a dinosaur, you draw a palm tree next to it. That palm tree is actually a cycad. And so you know all about cycads because they lived next to the dinosaurs. I can see someone who mind is just blown. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> oh, my God, plant-thieving dino nerds. Knock it off. Wow. Okay, and so now you both have spent time in, in the field. Any, any field stories that are ones that you tell around the campfire after you drink some fireball out of a thermos? <laughs> Which is what I do at campfires. Um, I, I have a, a very horrific story. Oh, um, yes! <laughs> which is really great. Uh, so I was collecting ferns. I also work on ferns as well with a, a colleague of mine and a friend of mine. Um, we were in Queensland, in Australia, in the tropics, and it, we were out you know, starting to collect ferns, and then it started to rain. I had got a cold, so I was just like, I'm going in the car, I've had enough. She was like, no, I'm going to keep going, so she co kept collecting the ferns, and then she went up to me, and she's like, do I have something in my eye? Oh. And she had a leech that had attached oh. onto her eyeball. So it was like a moment of panic, and I was like trying to create a salt solution out of my drink bottle, and... Um, and then, you know, one of the students who would come with us, she actually just went straight onto her eye and peeled the leech off her eyeball. So, nice. I love that it, for a botanist, like, that's a Tuesday. <laughs> You're like, yeah. I love that, like, if, if your friend has spinach in their teeth, definitely tell them. If they have a leech on their eyeball, though, like, mm, they'll discover it later. Oh my gosh, so you were unscathed though, other than yeah. emotionally. Well, she, she had, um, the leech had attached to her eyeball and so the, we went to the hospital um, and the doctor, he, he said, if you want to have a look, I can have a look. So I saw the actual bite mark on her eyeball. It was super cool. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Annie? Well, you've already milked venom from rattlesnakes, so any bites? No, uh, maybe. No bites. This was like traumatic for a different reason. Uh, my, my research depended on catching lizards that were, did not want to be caught. Oh. Um, I learned that they knew when I was facing them, but if I approached them with a mirror <gasps> backwards and noose them over my shoulder, I could get them. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> so, I don't know, they're, cle they're more clever than you think they are. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love it. They're like foiled again by a mirror. It happens. And now you work in, in data now. So how did you make the leap from academia to industry? Um, so my research was studying why lizards look different and how environment and genetics kind of interact to make organisms look different in nature. Um, what I found is that that's not that big of a leap in industry, especially when we're interested in human disease because the environment and your genetics kind of contributes to that. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of saw this application of like, you know, humans aren't that different from lizards. Like I can just <laughs> apply what I've already done <laughs> um, um, here. And it was, it was just cool to see an application in like people's everyday, everyday lives because lizards can't tell you like, you help me. Yeah. Um, but like people <laughs> might be able to. <laughs> and so what is your day-to-day -day work like? And do you dream about spreadsheets? I sometimes dream in code. Oh, wow. So oh, that's, that's really house. fun <laughs> when I have this problem and I'm just like, how do I solve this? Like sometimes I wake up and it's solved, <gasps> um, which, is, which is fun. But um, a lot of the time is in front of a computer. Um, but a lot of the time is also just talking to a lot of different types of people, which I think is really cool because I get to talk to genetic counselors and doctors and software engineers, and it's just cool to have all of those different people kind of working together. Yeah, is there any, um, any myths about what you do or about genetics that you would want to bust? Sorry, that's, that's a hard one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> any flim flam to debunk? I can uh, like not that I can think of. Okay. And what about, um, and when you are doing your work here at, uh, at the Academy, what is your day-to-day -day life like here? That's one of the things I love about the Academy is that it's completely unpredictable. Mm -hmm. um, one, <laughs> so Monday, for example, I was filming an ad for one of our upcoming exhibits about dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. um, today I was giving a talk about my research, so it was a scientific talk. Um, you know, I'm also mentoring, I have my students and I have a postdoc who works with me. 
I also do boring stuff like write papers, um, <laughs> apply for grants. Uh, we also give tours to, of our collections. So, um, I, you know, I've been doing that this last week as well. So, it's the great thing about working at a museum is that no two days are the same. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you guys wish that you could, like, travel back in time through a wormhole and tell each other before, or tell yourselves, not each other, that'd be weird. You're like, you're not, you don't know me, but we're going to be on, on a panel. Um, <laughs> but tell yourselves about your career or about, like, ups and downs or uh, and something that got in the way. I think, like, be okay with not knowing things. Because, like, so much of my time I wasted energy because I was afraid that someone would find out that I didn't know something. Mm -hmm. And then now, like, kind of having pushed past that, like, if I don't know something, I can ask someone and then I know the thing. <laughs> or, like, I know where to find out about the thing. Whereas before, I just kind of, like, spent a lot of time being upset that I didn't know something. Mm -hmm. So don't be afraid to admit that you still have things to learn. Yeah. Right. So just don't be, like, a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Or, like, don't pretend or don't think that people are going to eat you because you don't know something. Right. Or, like, on people on Twitter that pretend like they know everything and they don't. Um, so that's great. Like, have that's such a good thing to learn because I think so often we're really afraid to admit I don't know something and then we don't learn it. That's such good advice. What about you? Um, I think don't sweat the small stuff. There's a lot of, there's a lot of shit that we deal with, you know. <laughs> it's just like, I don't know, it, it's hard to be a woman in, in science. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you get treated differently and, you know, oftentimes, you know, I, I've been the only person of colour in a room and so it, it, it was challenging. Um, but the fact that I've made it now has, um, yeah, it, it's been great. <laughs> and I, I think that imposter syndrome that you guys both talked about is so, so real. And the more that you actually believe that you're an imposter, the less you'll ask because you'll be afraid not to, you know, not to know something and the less you get to learn. And, and um, yeah, I think I find that so many people I talk to are so afraid of, of finding out that they don't belong there, but everyone actually feels that way. And it's probably only women that, that you know, actually, well, actually women probably feel it more than men do. No offense, guys. But, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, so um, that's such good advice. What about, um, what about the hardest thing about your job, the shittiest thing about your job? I will say right now, there's not a lot of shitty things to report. Okay. I'm, like, I'm pretty, I like wake up in the morning pretty happy to go to my job. So that's great. That's, that's great. I'm like energized. <laughs> and I'm like, what am I going to do? Um, <laughs> I mean, there are still challenges. Mm -hmm. I still am hit with like, I don't know this thing. Yeah. But now I'm like, find the person who knows the thing and like, don't sit there and be afraid of it. <laughs> Can I tattoo that on my neck somehow? Because <laughs> that's like the best advice ever is find the person who knows the thing. I'll attribute you, I promise. Thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> and I, what about you? Anything challenging? Challenging is money. We, okay. we have to apply for grants and just to do our work. And there isn't much money around. You know, the funding rate is, you know, below 5%. So we can, you know, submit a grant proposal that's like 20, 30 pages um, and it's only got a 5% funding rate. So it's really disheartening. Um, but, you know, we've just got to keep at it just to try and get our work done. Mm -hmm. Any uh, part, any cocktail party facts that you guys like to drop that blow minds at all? I already the psychad thing being in the back of a dinosaur drawing is like my mind is forever changed. <laughs> well, so there are psychads that sell for like a million dollars, thirty thousand dollars for a tiny little plant because they're so rare. Oh my gosh, gotta get in the psychad business. <laughs> I have a fun fact about lizards and ticks. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> So I studied uh, West, the western fence lizard, and so if you ever, you grew up catching lizards with a blade of grass around California, there were those lizards. Um, they do a really cool thing, which is that they have things in their blood that neutralize Lyme disease. Yay. And so they have their own ecological niche where the ticks attach to them, they circulate the blood, the lizard's blood gets rid of Lyme disease, the tick detaches, and then no Lyme disease on that tick. Thanks, lizards. Yeah, so I had a bunch of lizards with ticks that I gave to researchers so that they could look at the ticks and figure out how they're doing that. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, what about things that you love about your job the most? What's, what do you love? What's the best thing? Um, I, I love working at the Academy. I love how everybody is so passionate about what they do and we all care about you know, educating people and, and sharing our stories. Um, and I love the other women that I meet in science. You know, I've made the best of friends here, especially at the Academy, um, through science. Good, good peeps. 
What about you? Repeat the question, because I just <laughs> was so into your response. <laughs> Don't, I just like what you said. I love that you didn't know and you said you weren't sure. <laughs> that's great. Like, that's in action. Um, what's your favorite thing about your job? Do you love when, like, a data crunches and you see a curve? Do you love, like, color coding things? I think the thing that I love, it actually happened yesterday. I spent, I think, a month trying to build something. Mm -hmm. And then I just, like, was like, all right, Jesus, take the wheel. I hope this works. <laughs> um, and I just, I tried to see if it would run. And it ran. And it did what I thought. And I, like, burst out into tears. Because yeah. I was like, it worked. Oh, my god, it worked. <laughs> That's um, amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Listen, everyone give them a big hit, round of applause. Hold on, I'm going to hold your question. <laughs> amazing. Thank you for being here. If you have questions for them, hang on to them in your brains, because we're going to do a Q&A afterward, but they're amazing. And then we're also, I'm also going to make you guys shout out your Twitters at the end so that you guys can follow them in real time, because... Look at all these new friends. Come on up, we've got, and we split the panel in two panels, and so now we get to talk to two more amazing ologists and ladies. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here. I've already talked to one of you, and a uh, virologist, a molecular epidemiologist here at the Academy. She just gave a little talk on this, uh, this, this little thing called COVID-19. Um, and so I asked you a bunch of questions, and then we also have someone who studied neurobiology, who is a biologist and also a science communicator and a total badass. So introduce yourselves, if you will. Okay, I'm Shannon Bennett. I'm chief of science and curator of microbiology here at the Academy, and I study virus evolution, their origins from natural systems, and how and why they cause disease in humans. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. Um, my name is Monica Felio Moher. I am a neurobiologist by training, but a science communicator by trade. Um, I work with two nonprofits, and I wear tons of hats. Um, but I like to summarize my work as I use science communication and storytelling to make science more equitable and inclusive. Awesome. Amazing, amazing. And you both kind of have in common that you use storytelling to communicate science. I know that you started your work doing theatrical plays in, in part of your field work, and that got you into, um, into you know, your virology career. Can you explain a little bit about your views on how to communicate science and why story is important? Sure. Yeah. So... Um, I, I firmly believe that you have to meet people where they are and mm -hmm. find the hook that catches their interest. Mm -hmm. And speaking of inclusivity and diversity, we're all different. We all find different connection points with the story. Mm -hmm. And so I love to play around with telling the stories about, you know, viruses. They can sometimes feel obscure. They can't be seen. They're awful little. They're very remote. Uh, so I, I really love to bring... The, I call it the art of parasitism home and make it <laughs> personal. <laughs> the art of par parasitism. It's, do you have a biography title yet? Because I feel like that's a pretty good contender. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, that's a book, I think. Yeah, please thank me in the acknowledgments. <laughs> you got to tattoo that on your neck. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, people, their, their life experiences, their their culture, it influences how they understand, how they engage with, how they value science. And we need to keep that in mind when we're talking to people about, about science. Like, I think as a scientist, I work with a lot of scientists, and scientists, we feel like data, it's, that's all it is. Like, if I give you the facts, I'm going to be convinced, and that's not true. You know, people, when people are maybe not believing that they can catch this coronavirus, it was like, it's fine if I come and, you know, I'm surrounded by 200 people. If I was told that I have coronavirus, I don't. But, um, you know, like, people, people have fears and people have questions. And so it's, it's, it's about meaningful connections. It's about understanding where people are coming from and listening. I think that's the most important part about, about communication and storytelling is about listening and it's about empathy and it's about where is that common ground and how do we start there so that we, make, we can move together somewhere. Mm 
And you studied neurobiology as well. Did you, um, do you ever think about the brain when you're communicating science? And like, how will this land? What will people remember? Yes, I yeah. do. I mean, I, I, for, for storytelling in particular, there's a, a lot of neuroscience about, um, about storytelling. There's mm -hmm. this uh, thing called narrative transportation. So, you know, think about your favorite movie or if you had ever heard somebody um, recite a poem or tell a story on stage and you're so engrossed in, in what they're saying, you can almost put yourself in their shoes that's, you know, it's all about their parts of the brain that are in charge of that, and I don't know any of the names because that's <laughs> not my expertise. Um, but, you know, there, there is a lot of science about why storytelling works and why it helps people connect and find common ground. So I absolutely do. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talked, uh, we recorded an episode, by the way. You guys are first to know that. We, uh, so, yeah, Dr. Ben and I recorded an episode on virology, so that'll be up on Tuesday if you listen to ologies. Um, I know, very excited. <laughs> Amazing. And, um, and we talked about um, your history a little bit and how you got into and how you kind of had empathy for um, people who are maybe afflicted with some of the, the diseases that you study. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your field work? Just a little and yeah. kind of heads up on that. Yeah. So I, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up until very Late, later in life, and so in college, I, 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 loved, I loved theater and, and communicating in performance art. I thought that was so cool. Um, I loved biology. I spent a lot of time camping and picnicking as a kid, but I, I didn't really have a direction until I had a volunteer opportunity in West Africa when I was in college, and I landed this great gig where I would go and uh, run a theater program for kids in this upcountry school in Liberia near the Guinea border. And we would address some of the community uh, pain points, risk factors to disease. So we'd put on these skits around primary health care issues, what a vaccine is all about, and we'd use th theater to communicate it. Mm -hmm. I was thrilled. It sounded like the perfect meshing of my theater love of communication as well as my biology passions. Mm -hmm. I got there, I, as any good 19-year-old traveler that's never gone internationally before, I went and got my vaccines and my anti-malarials, and I showed up in West Africa, and within two weeks, I had full-blown cerebral malaria, Woo! which is caused by Plasmodium falciparum. It is no picnic. I was in the throes of fever chill cycles when I picked up a case of amoebic dysentery. Ouch. Which uh, plasmodium is transmitted by mosquito. Uh, amoebic dysentery, or Entamoeba histolytica, is the scientific name, is transmitted by fecal oral root. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> I ate shit. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't mean to. Somehow. <laughs> oh, no. Not fun. You're 19. Yeah. You're like, 19. Woo! I've got uh, Spring I break. a double whammy. Yeah. yeah. It was it was not pretty. Not pretty. And then I was trying to. I had a, a, you know, I had a buddy driving me into the local leper colony. As you do. I, it's true. To I mean to get to get treatment. And um, at the same time, I had a. I developed a skin infection. Oh my so, god. So so everybody has a full array of microbes that live on our skin, and one of those is Staphylococcus aureus, and it's an opportunist. Uh, sometimes, and it found an opportunity oh, no. <laughs> and uh, launched into a full infection. So I was in a leper colony. Leprosy is caused by bacteria, by a bacterium. Uh, I had staph from my skin. I had fecal oral contamination and oh, amoeba histolytica. Plus, I have mosquito borne malaria. So I had a lot of time as I was <laughs> languishing to think about the variety of parasites <laughs> and the ways that they got me and the ways that they were continuing to get me. And I really, I really came away with a, a newfound, deep, personal appreciation I, I for what I call the art of parasitism. It's a way of life. <laughs> for the parasites. Uh, it's, it's really, it, and it's evolved many times over, over all of the uh, life forms that we know of today. Many have evolved parasitism. It works. It's a good gig if you can get it. Mm -hmm. And it got me, and I've, I've never turned back. I came back with a new passion to study 
Parasitism. And I love that you, you came back and you studied parasitism. You could have just become absolutely convinced that a witch put a curse on you and yeah. gone a totally different road. I, I haven't ruled that out. <laughs> And, like, so we just heard her story. And, of course, like, when you're that emotionally invested in someone's narrative, you're like, oh, I get why she has dedicated her life to understanding that. Do you find that when you're communicating science, do you have to kind of put it in terms for people to really, like, get emotionally hooked? Or where do you, where do you become, um, how do you kind of get into people's brains and give them a little, like, something they can hook onto? So the way that I started actually doing science communication was by combining, so I'm from Puerto Rico, and um, I ne when I was growing up, I never saw science in the media or, you know, I didn't even know that they were scientists in Puerto Rico until I got to college. And so when I started doing science communication, I started doing so by connecting culture, popular culture, um, you know, like local, like everyday language to science. And I actually remember the very first article that I wrote for the, the local, the main newspaper in Puerto Rico was about this disease called um, guinea worm. And it's a disease that's been, it's been almost eradicated. It still exists in some countries. And the way I started the article was, so it went something like this. Imagine that you have to take a stick to pull out a worm out of your skin, a worm that's as thin as a spaghetti, and you have to pull it out of your skin, in by inch, for about three weeks. Oh, jeez. Dr. Bennett's like, yeah, I've done that too. <laughs> no, <laughs> you haven't. You've never had it. You've never had any worm. Okay, good. That's right. Um, and so, you know, like I, and I, you know, I taught, I was actually talking about this Puerto Rican scientist who's been leading the effort or had been leading the effort to eradicate um, this disease. And I just remember as a kid, I always, I love stories. When my mom and I would go to the mall, I didn't want Barbies. I wanted books. Um, like, I love books so much. I remember we were once um, going home, and we were on the highway, and the, we were, had a pretty old car, and we, we had to pull the window down, like, manually. <laughs> and we were, like, driving 65 down the highway, and I'm, like, pulling my window. I had this new book, and, like, I put it out of the window, and I just went, like, screamed at the top of my legs, like, look at my book! <laughs> and then, like, the wind proceeded to rip it out of no! my hands. Um, no. And I cried, and my, I actually made my mom stop on the side of the highway to try to rescue it, rescue it didn't work. Oh. Um, and so, but you know, I think early on, I, I understood that there was a way to connect what people knew and loved with, with science, and to, to, in that way, make it relevant to, for their lives. Because I remember learning things and being like, so what? Like, I don't know what this is. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, what about I know the lizards. Worms. I love lizards. Worms, I'm, I'm okay with. <laughs> Although I did work with worms for my PhD. I, I did my PhD using C. elegans. <gasps> That's right. I was looking that up. C. elegans, which is a worm uh, named because it's elegant looking, right? Absolutely. I mean, if you see it wiggle, it's just like really elegant. Yes. Totally. It has this, a small, a tasteful strand of pearls. It's just like, hello, fresh blowout. C. elegans. Um, <laughs> No, I looked that up, and I was like, whoa, what is it? <laughs> um, and so now tell me about something that you, yeah, some, and, and what's the word I'm thinking of? Like, no, I want to say objective, but that's not what it, an obstacle. Thank you. Hi, I got up a little early this morning. Um, an <laughs> obstacle that you, you feel like you wish you could go back and tell yourself, like, or something about, um, something about your path that was unexpected that maybe ended up turning out for the better or, or something that you, you got over. If you could give advice to people pursuing a career in STEM, what would you tell them? What would you whisper like a, like a ghost, like, hey, do this? I would say you contain multitudes. Um, I, when I, so I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, did my undergrad there, and then I moved to, to Boston, and that was a pretty rough transition because, you know, the weather, um, <laughs> among other things. Um, but, you know, I think the roughest transition was when I was in Puerto Rico and I was doing my training, I was doing research, I was very proud to be a Puerto Rican scientist. And then I moved to the States and I was like, you had to choose. You either, are you either Puerto Rican or you're a scientist. You can't be both. And I think 
it took me a long winding path to understand that I am able to do what I do because of my identities, because of those multiple identities that I contain and, and the life experiences that have come with those. And I feel particularly with, with for scientists that come from marginalized communities, science tries to suppress those. It's like, mm, you don't fit in this box. Not our ideal, so just put that aside. And no, like I want people to bring their whole selves into whatever it is that they do because that's what makes them awesome. It's what makes them be able to do what they do. So I would tell myself that. That's such a good message. That's so important. Dr. Bennett, Dr. Bennett, would you have gotten different immunizations? Would you have done different things? <laughs> Actually, I, 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 I don't think I would say anything to myself. I love all the mistakes that I made, all the <laughs> mistakes. Yeah. I, I, the, the journey that I took, I'm, I, I really feel like uh, I am the culmination of all those maybe missteps, but together they make me who I am, and so I have no regrets. Good. I, I would say that science today, and, and maybe all always, is really m way more innovative when you mix things up, when you combine different disciplines, mm -hmm. and I'm really happy that I dabbled in theater, and then I, I dabbled in math, and I loved parasites, and, mm -hmm. I, and, and I think that we, if we can bring together different perspectives, it makes our science a lot more innovative. So I would say don't commit too early. Be okay with not knowing what you want to be uh, and try and experiment in different ways and then bring all those things together and it gives you that unique sauce to really innovate in science. Nice. That's like, yes, diversify. <laughs> That's so smart. <laughs> So diversify your interest portfolio goes for everyone, right? Yeah, and what about, um, we'll do a quick rapid fire, uh, crappiest thing about your jobs? Things that just, things that you're annoy you sometimes, even if you love your job. Having to beg for money. Yeah. It's like, I mean, there's, there's little money for science, there's even less for science communication, because people are it's like, it's about the discoveries, guess what? If you don't communicate them, they didn't happen. Yeah. So give us money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about you? So um, I joined the academy in 2011 as the associate curator of microbiology. And mm -hmm. then in 2016, I took on a, a lot more administrative duties. Mm -hmm. So as the chief of science, I my job is to boss the other scientists around. <laughs> scientists are completely unbossable. <laughs> and so my job got a lot better when I realized I just need to stop bossing scientists around and just let them do their thing, and provide fertilizer, give them a lot of space to be independent, yeah. and it's genius. So the day-to-day the -day crap about my job now is the meetings. Oh. I, I was actually thinking of getting a catheter put in because... <laughs> I don't have time to go to the bathroom. <laughs> what about your favorite things? Um, the, the creativity. Yeah. Um, I thought when I left research, you know, my, my favorite part of research was problem solving. Mm -hmm. and, and actually being a communicator has stretched and challenged my creativity in ways research never did. Yeah, that sounds perfect. What about you, favorite thing? My favorite thing is field work. Mm -hmm. I don't get to do it as much as I'd like, but there's this secret code that uh, we call, when you write a grant, you describe yourself as a principal investigator, mm -hmm. but I actually think of a PI as a parasite incubator. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the best way to get a parasite is to do field work. It's hey. awesome. <laughs> awesome. Gotta get a bot fly one day. Well, we're gonna do, give them a, Big yeah. round of applause. We're going to do, uh, love for you guys to come up. <laughs> We're going to give you guys a chance to ask some very, very smart people as stupid a question as you want. Um, as you can tell, there are no stupid ones. So we've got, great. All right, we've got someone handing out a mic. So we're just going to alight upon you like a microphone fairy. So two of you mentioned funding and how difficult it is to come by that. For us who want to be funding spaces for women in science and women of color in science, 
where can we be putting our dollars that we don't really have but are pretending we have? Oh. Is there a place? I, well, I'm going to just do a very shameless plug. Um, my, so one of the organizations I work with is called Ciencia Puerto Rico. And if you go to my Twitter, which I will give you later, mm -hmm. um, we have a program to inspire uh, Latina and Puerto Rican girls to follow STEM careers and use science to become leaders in their communities. And right, right now we're fundraising for that. Um, so there's a place where you can put your money, and I would be eternally grateful. <laughs> um, Dr. Nguyen, so I... Is it on? Oh, it is. Okay, sorry. Um, so at the Academy, we accept donations, and so if you just want to, you know, contact the Academy, I would gladly accept <laughs> any, anything at all. Thank you. Can we pass and a hat I would around? add that, that we up the ante to STEAM. So we like STEM, but we do STEAM, which is science, technology, art, and yeah, yeah, anyway, science, yeah, engineering, math, yeah, engineering. So <laughs> have an extra letter in there. <laughs> and um, and once again, in case you're like whose names, I'm just going to give first names that way. We'll do a pastor: Seema, Natalie, uh, Shannon, and uh, Monica. So just in case you're like, I'm not sure who to address. Um, another question? Oh yeah, hi. Uh, I'm actually a graduate student, which I think now makes me a parasite. Being in <laughs> Own it. I, I will try. <laughs> but that's like related to my question, which is that, so I'm, uh, I'm in theoretical chemistry, um, which means I'm at the center of like four different fields interdisciplinarily. Um, and that means that not only am I like ex at this very small being in the middle of a giant field of science, I'm in the middle of like four giant fields of science. It's so, like, I'm wondering like how you, own your your little corner when the rest of it you're like walking among giants in some way so yeah carving a niche and owning it is part of it psychologically just like own it just believe you belong so I, I if you if you charted your challenge as the Venn diagram set of all the, the you know the spaces you could move in and look at the intersection, it's actually a pretty small space. So I actually think you are in the enviable position of being uh, at the unique intersection of multi multiple disciplines where most of us cannot live and own. So I'm kind of jealous, actually. I think, you're, I think you're good. And I would say you're, you're not a parasite. You're actually the people who keep the field moving because you're doing the work. So you're not a parasite. So I don't consider parasite an insult. It's not an insult. Uh, where is the microphone? Oh, back here. Oh, bring it on. I, I had a question for Dr. Bennett. Um, I was just curious as to your opinion on the use of bacteriophages as an alternative to antibiotics. I think back so bacteriophages are the viruses that take out bacteria and they're really good at their job actually and every one of us are not only teeming with bacteria but we are teeming with the bacteriophages that regulate those bacterial communities and the basic philosophy of a bacteriophage is it's a called the kill the winner philosophy so the minute that a bacterium becomes overdominant in the system, the bacteriophage that's specific to that bacterium knocks it down. So you could argue that it's far more sensitive, far more specific, and far more important than any antibiotic we could cook up in a lab. So I'm a big fan. I think it's an emerging field. Stay tuned and own your microbes and their bacteriophages. <laughs> nice. Where did the mic land? Over here? Does someone else have a question over here? Did we see a hand? Over here? Oh, there's one way back there. I say we do it. Get back there. You deserve it. I While we're you. waiting, I just want to yeah. say that the species, the Latin name of the guinea worm is Dracunculus metanensis. Ooh, what does it and mean? And that whole twisty thing of the worm around the stick gave us the medical symbol. People think <gasps> it's the snake in the Garden of Eden. It is not. Dracunculus medinensis, because that twisty worm gave rise to our medical symbol. Look at this! Wow. Yes! Wow. 
drop that knowledge at your next awkward dinner. <laughs> you win. That's amazing. <gasps> Question back there? Yeah. Was it about a guinea worm? Um, so I'm with like my fellow grad students right now, and then um, we're all kind of doing different things, but like us as women in STEM, especially in the ecology department, we are like pretty in much in like a really small field compared to the molecular cellular biology folks. So for those who've experienced like only being part of like a small niche type of research, what's your advice to us going into this big world of like PhD and uh, a career in science? We got a live one. So I actually started as an ecologist of parasites. <laughs> and uh, then I moved into molecular, cell and molecular, because viruses are too small to use ecology to work on them. But actually, that's not true. So I would say that ecologists learn way more math than the cell and the molecular people, and that is your secret weapon. So you are statistically and mathematically literate in the way that that molecular biologists and cell and molecular people are not. Um, cell and molecular people have to be what we call in science reductionists. The, so they surface, they, they focus on problems by reducing things down to the bare bones, whereas ecologists often have to be big picture. So that's your other secret, rep, secret weapon, is that you integrate information and you're good at it. And so I, yeah. I think it's awesome. Some, another fun fact related to industry is the ecology model that predicts like fish population ebb and flow is very, very similar to the model that Netflix uses to recommend things to you. <laughs> so your, your skill set might actually be a lot more applied than you think it is. Yes, yes. And I, I love the fact that you're here with your friends and you've found your tribe. So, you know, use them, use your friends, and keep going, keep at it. You know what, yes. And I love that this panel is like, you guys are like Antiques Roadshow, but for people's careers, you're like, you don't even know what you're sitting on. Do you know how valuable this is? Like, everyone's getting their mind blown. This is the best. <laughs> I'm like, uh, let's see, another question over here. Hi, um, this is for Monica. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering how you use the science of communication to talk about climate change in a way that empowers people and doesn't necessarily just spiral them into this wave of despair. Hmm. Great question. That is a hard one. Um, <laughs> well, first, there's a lot of people researching this, so I would recommend that you look at those. Um, but, you know, it's what I was saying earlier is, is really thinking about common ground. You know, if you tell people that are in the middle of the country that sea level rise, like the, the sea is going to rise, you know, however many feet by whatever year, they're going to be like, I'm landlocked. Okay. So, like, bring it home. What, what affects them? Why does it matter for them? Is it because they're, um, they're crops, like they're growing crops, that that's going to affect them? So really think about how to make it, personal and how to make it emotional because um, that's what people care about like people it's hard for human brains not anyone to think about what's going to happen 50 years from now people care about the now about what's affecting them now and they also care about what's affecting the things that they care about so really looking at connecting through values and and beliefs is is really important to at least start a conversation and the other thing is listening um, you know, if you're going into a conversation with someone who say it's a climate change denier and they're like, well, I don't believe in you. And you're like, well, you're wrong that there's no conversation. So listening to people, where are they coming from? Why do they believe this? And can you find something that you have in common to at least have a conversation? That's, yeah, that's such good advice. So make it relatable and make it, give it context. That's awesome. I know because so many people are just, what do I do? I know. Yeah, great. Here, here at the academy, we find that you have to give people positive, hopeful messages that are real around mm -hmm. climate change because it's really completely diffusing to talk about the negative side of things. So we always try to identify some positive actions that people can take that make sense to them. I think that's great in life too. You know, 
just trying to go about things with optimism, you'll get and farther. I'll add one other thing that was prompted by, by your comment is giving people small actions that they can take because you know climate change is such a big problem and we're all, all often talking about it from this glo doom and gloom perspective. So people are like, I don't know where to start. You know, you can start with, with small actions and so those small actions, grounding them in, in the person's context and, and culture, it's gonna make them you know, think about, or I can't do something. Like I can, I can be empowered and I can take ownership of this issue. Another question? Oh. Uh, I think this is it's Sina. So you mentioned that you um, dream about like code working out. So like when I dream about my research, I can never remember the genius things that I had. <laughs> do you actually remember and can you work it out? Yeah. I, I, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, something that helps. Is this on? Yes, it's on. Um, something that helps is like, wake up and then turn on your like memo on your phone and then just say whatever is happening in your brain. <laughs> so I, I have a lot of weird memos on my phone of like things that I said <laughs> when I woke up. Great advice. And then Monica, I, I wanted to ask the second question because um, as a graduate student, I'm kind of pushed into the academic realm and that is some place that I've never ever wanted to go. And I've really found science communication to be a wonderful, wonderful outlet. How did you transition from academia to science communication? Um, I mean, we could have a longer conversation offline. Um, <laughs> but what I will say is there were three things that were really, really important for me to make that transition. One was volunteering. Most of the relevant experience I had when I made that transition, so I finished my PhD and I immediately transition into doing communication and outreach. Most of the relevant experience came from volunteering. My PhD gave me valuable skills, but they were not really the communication skills. Um, the other thing was networking. So once I decided that's what I wanted to do, I started to reach out to people actually on Twitter. Twitter was super helpful to find the people that are doing science communication. Um, and then the third one was being strategic with what I was doing. There were times where I wasn't properly balancing my PhD and my outreach. Um, and so being strategic where I was investing my time and energy, doing the things that were going to give me the biggest return on that investment, um, that was really important. And I did want to, that actually kind of segues us just beautifully to, y'all take out your phones and follow some amazing women in, in science here. I'd love to just pass it. If you guys want to give your handles, follow these geniuses. And then also you can probably tweet at them and ask them more questions and just fawn over them in general. So yeah, do you want to just shout out your handle? Yes, my Twitter handle is my last name, B-O-U-Z-I-D, and then my initials N-M. B-O-U-Z-I-D-N-M. You got it? Y'all got it? Okay, cool. I'm seeing thumbs up. I'm seeing heads down. I like it. And I'm in Nagalingam, so double N, A G A L I N for Natalie, G U M for Mary. Let's do it one more time, just in case anyone didn't get it. N N N N A G A L I N G U M for Mary. Awesome. What kind of picture is your profile picture? Sorry. What? What's your profile picture like? It's me, but there's also a psychad. I figured. I figured. <laughs> I figured it was one of one or the other, and it was a double whammy. That's exciting. <laughs> and yeah, what's yours? Um, microbe explorer. <laughs> nice. So it's got that two E's. Yeah, microbe explorer. Cool. Two microbe e's. explorer. Yeah. Mine is uh, Moefelu. So M O E F, as in Frank E L I U. That's my handle. So M O E F E L I U. Awesome. So tomorrow, you guys can remember old school, hashtag FF. FF these ladies and some Cal Academy um, and talk about what a great and inspiring talk you had. And the last thing I want to do before we go is if you are in science, I would love for you to stand up so that we can applaud you. So are you, if, you're already, if you're already in the back and you're in science, raise your hand. But yeah, if you're a scientist, get the hell up. Let's give everyone here some applause. Thank you.
uh, just low-key thanks for changing the world. <laughs> thanks for fixing our problems. So that's it for tonight, you guys. Thank you so much for being here. I think the live stream might be on the Cal Academy Facebook page. So if anyone missed it and they're weeping, send them a link. Um, and then, yes, follow them. Have a great rest of the night. Thank you so much for being here. You guys are awesome.